Hi guys, hope you are doing well. In this video today, I'm going to um, get one of these um, scientific papers screen read. So the title of this paper is uh, Review of Under-Recognized Adjunctive Therapies for Cancer. And uh, this particular uh, review publication came out on the 29th of, um, uh, 29th of September 2022, which is like three days ago. And uh, looking at the content, I think it's a, a very important article or review paper that uh, people should know about, uh, especially doctors. And because doctors don't have time, uh, they, they are busy um, looking after the patients and they have very little time to actually educate themselves. Uh, so I wanted to put it in the audio format uh, as a YouTube video so that uh, they can basically listen to it while commuting to work or something like that. So uh, without further ado, let's go and uh, start. So this is the paper. Um, uh, I have downloaded the PDF and uh, made slight adjustments just so that uh, it's easier for the screen reader to read, uh, read it out loud. So now I'm going to use the read aloud feature of Microsoft Edge browser to uh, read this paper. So let's start. URL https colon double forward slash www.mdpi.com forward slash 2072-6694 forward slash 14 forward slash 19 forward slash 4780. Simple summary. This review presents cancer and primary care providers with an overview of underappreciated adjunctive measures that may improve their patients' quality of life and survival. This is not a comprehensive review, but adjunctive recommendations, which may be easily addressed by the provider and acceptable to the cancer patient. These include exercise, diet, stress reduction techniques, recognition and management of sleep problems, advice on smoking cessation, and use of selective nutraceuticals and pharmaceuticals as adjuvants. In addition, patients may be more compliant if suggestions and referrals are made by their trusted providers. Abstract. Patients and providers may not be aware that several adjunctive measures can significantly improve the quality of life. Life, response to treatment, and possibly outcomes for cancer patients. This manuscript presents a review of practical underrecognized adjunctive therapies that are effective including exercise, stress reduction techniques such as mindfulness, massage, yoga, tai chi, breathing exercises, importance of sleep quality, diet modifications such as calorie restriction at the time of chemotherapy and avoidance of high carbohydrate foods, supplements such as aspirin, green tea, turmeric, and melatonin, and reproposed prescription medications such as metformin and statins. Each recommendation should be tailored to the individual patient to assure no contraindications. 1. Introduction After a patient has been diagnosed with cancer, treatment is usually initiated with chemotherapy or radiation therapy, and adjunctive therapy may not be considered. An adjunctive therapy is one that may improve quality of life and or survival and should be unlikely to cause harm. A recent survey of members of the American Society of Clinical Oncologists identified that most respondents agreed with the importance of exercise, weight management, and diet recommendations for cancer patients. However, only 19 to 23 percent of oncologists refer patients to an exercise program or REF1. A 2017 systematic review concluded that exercise is beneficial before, during, and after cancer treatment, across all cancer types, and for a variety of cancer-related impairments. Moderate to vigorous exercise is the best level of exercise intensity to improve physical function and mitigate cancer-related impairments, too. Now, multiple medical societies consider exercise as medicine. Unfortunately, unless the individual had previously established an exercise routine, just advising them may not be sufficient and a referral to an exercise program is necessary. This review highlights the importance of all types of exercise 
and other unappreciated adjunctive therapies such as stress reduction techniques, including meditation or mindfulness, breathing exercises, massage, good sleep hygiene, melatonin, turmeric, green tea, diet modifications, and reproposed medications for cancer patients. Some cancers are known to have a high recurrence rate, typically related to the presence of residual cancer stem cells or REF3, which can be modulated by some of the therapies discussed here. It is important for the oncologist as well as the primary care provider to be knowledgeable regarding these adjunctive therapies and be willing to recommend them as well as using targeted chemotherapy agents. 2. Exercise as Cancer Therapy 2.1 Exercise recommendations. The recently published American Society of Clinical Oncology guidelines now clearly recommends that oncologists should encourage patients undergoing active treatment with curative goal to conduct regular aerobic and resistance exercise because of the beneficial evidence for REF4. Specific guidance for patients with advanced cancers necessitates further research for REF4. Another systematic review and meta-analysis demonstrated that exercise could significantly reduce mortality in patients with cancer or REF5. The intensity and quantity of exercise were significant factors that affected the immune system, cancer cell survival, and angiogenesis or REF6. Immune lymphocytic natural killer cell numbers are rapidly increased with 30 minutes of moderate exercise or REF7. Tumor cells survive in poorly oxygenated tissue, and exercise can improve oxygenation through increased cardiac output, resulting in better efficacy of therapy. Prior studies have indicated that vigorous exercise of six or more metabolic equivalents per hour was more effective than a less intense exercise of longer duration. Encouraging patients to achieve greater than or equal to 150 minute weekly or 75 minutes of vigorous exercise along with resistance exercise for all major muscle groups is recommended UREF7. Unfortunately, surveys have identified that barriers exist for patients to accomplish these recommendations and providing an exercise DVD simultaneously improved compliance among breast cancer patients UREF8. And one one-week randomized trial involving head and neck cancer, H and C, patients receiving chemoradiotherapy comparing structured to conventional exercise recommendations, showed a statistical improvement in quality of life, less fatigue and maintenance of functional capacity among the structured group REF9. 2.2. Tai Chi, Yoga, and Baduanjin as a form of exercise. Since some patients may not be physically able to perform aerobic exercise or resistance training, Tai Chi, Yoga, or Baduanjin exercises may be more feasible alternatives to suggest. A systematic review evaluating Tai Chi identified benefits for fatigue and sleep quality among cancer patients, but there was insufficient evidence on long-term outcomes for REF10. Another exercise option is also Baduanjin, a traditional Chinese Qigong exercise that consists of eight easy movements of the body, which in a systematic review and meta-analysis of randomized control trials, has been found to improve cancer fatigue, sleep, and quality of life among cancer patients for REF11. Yoga and Tai Chi have numerous benefits, including stress reduction and physical conditioning for cancer patients. Yoga therapy has been demonstrated to reduce fatigue for REF12, improve quality of life for REF13, and reduce daily pain. Among patients with metastatic breast cancer for REF14, these findings were also identified in a recent meta-analysis among breast cancer patients taking yoga to controls who were not taking yoga, showing yoga improved COEL, reduced stress, depression, fatigue, anxiety, and pain severity for REF15. A similar meta-analysis focusing on Tai Chi identified a positive short-term effect on cancer-related fatigue in some cancer patients the longer it was performed a REF-16. 3. Stress Reduction Practices 
Receiving a cancer diagnosis is a major emotional shock for a patient and providers should acknowledge the stress reaction that occurs among patients. To help patients manage this stress, besides incorporating some form of regular exercise as discussed above, providers should encourage patients to explore non-physical options such as meditation or mindfulness practices, massage, art or music therapy, acupuncture, or mindful breathing practices. Each of these has beneficial effects and one or more may appeal to the patient. Providers should be willing to refer the patient for counseling or therapy as requested by the patient's preference. Stress associated with a cancer diagnosis may activate both the sympathetic nervous system and the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. These activations may result in the release of glucocorticoid hormones that contribute to the progression of cancer or REF-17. In the 1970s, Kabat-Zinn REF-18 established the first standardized mindfulness-based intervention called Mindfulness-Based Stress Reduction MBSR. Currently, many similar programs are available on the internet. This training encourages individuals to live in the present purposely pay attention and be non-judgmental to the experience. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis of 29 randomized controlled trials involving 3,476 patients found that patients with mindfulness training experienced significant improvements in quality of life and reductions in stress, anxiety, fatigue, and depression, compared to controls the REF-19. Additional studies are currently underway to assess the benefits of mindfulness and its effect on cancer immunity, REF-20. However, there is an abundance of evidence that supports the initial benefits of mindfulness on quality of life improvements for patients faced with cancer, REF-21, 22. Some cancer centers have begun incorporating integrative practices to respond to the unmet emotional needs of cancer patients, REF-22, 23. Examples of practices that are incorporated after a consultation with patients may include massage, acupuncture, MBSR counseling, art and music therapy. Clinical practice guidelines on the evidence-based use of such practices during and after breast cancer treatment is now available for reference, the REF-24. Both acupuncture treatment and massage therapy were each found to significantly reduce stress and pain among cancer patients, the REF-23. Although there are limited references regarding the effectiveness of art or music therapy, a recent systematic review concluded benefits of both therapies for breast cancer patients for improving quality of life and emotional well-being, the REF-24, 25. There are several different techniques on mindful breathing practices that have been shown to help reduce stress or anxiety and depression. Examples include diaphragmatic breathing, the REF-26, Sudarshan Kriya. Yoga, SKY, breathing, the REF-27, and mindful breathing, a technique that requires a patient to sit upright and for five minutes, three times daily focus only on their breathing, the REF-28. This simple practice of recentering their mind if it wanders has been shown to significantly reduce stress. 4. Management of sleep disturbances as an adjunctive cancer. Therapy Although management of sleep disorders may not be considered an adjunctive therapy, any therapy that aids the primary goal of helping to treat the cancer patient is an adjunctive therapy. Unfortunately, many providers may not recognize the importance of sleep regarding its effect on the immune system and therefore its effect on cancer survival. A systematic review by Santoso identified insomnia, hypersomnolence, and sleep-related breathing disturbances among HNC patients were common before, during and after treatment, the REF-29. Reviews using the Pittsburgh Sleep Quality Index, PSQI, Sleep Study Survey, identified that 69% of patients with cancer experienced poor sleep, a REF-30, and close to a third of HNC patients have either persistent or worsening sleep problems, a REF-31. 
Obstructive sleep apnea occurs more often in HNC than other cancers both before and after treatment, the REF 32 to 34. The importance of sleep in the survival of patients with cancer has not been adequately studied, but a recent review of how sleep affects the immune system supported the hypothesis that poor sleep could lead to unfavorable outcomes, the REF 35. The 2017 Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine was awarded for the discovery of the molecular mechanisms that control the circadian rhythm REF 36, which is critical for normal cellular function. Patel and Kondratov, who REF 37, who recently reviewed the importance of circadian clock genes and their relationship to the metabolic pathways that control cancer development. They showed that a high incidence of cancer was found in night shift workers. That finding resulted in the 2019 designation of night shift work as a group 2 a carcinogen by the International Agency for Research on Cancer, the REF 38. Examples of night shift work-related risks included increases in breast cancer among women, the REF 39, and prostate cancer among men, the REF 40. The disproportionate increase in cancer among night shift workers is potentially related to a disruption of melatonin activities, the REF 41. Analyses of the circadian gene database have estimated that approximately 2,000 genes that may be influenced by the circadian rhythm could affect cancer, the REF 42. The epidemiological study of prostate cancer, EPICAP, was a population-based, case control study specifically designed to investigate the role of environmental and genetic factors in prostate cancer. A recent analysis of circadian gene variants in the men enrolled in EPICAP identified specific circadian genes associated with aggressive prostate cancer among night workers, the REF 43. Liu et al. REF 44 presented a comprehensive analysis of how some cancers affected the Circadian clock. Patients often complain of disordered sleep after initiating chemotherapy. Savoditol confirmed that progressive sleep impairments occurred with repeated chemotherapy, based on wrist actigraphy recordings from patients with breast cancer, a REF 45. In a prospective cohort study to determine whether chemotherapy could impair melatonin production, Liatol, a REF 46, examined 180 women who underwent adjuvant chemotherapy for breast cancer. They examined first morning urinary melatonin levels and sleep-wake activity, rhythms, and patterns. They found disruptions in the sleep-wake rhythm and a reduction in the urinary melatonin level. After sleep apnea is excluded as a cause of poor sleep and is corrected with appropriate measures, the first-line treatment is typically cognitive behavior therapy or REF 47, but this approach may be time-consuming and patients may not be receptive. Some studies have shown that administering melatonin could provide benefits by helping reset the circadian rhythm and improve sleep or REF 48. A. Randomized, placebo-controlled trial for testing melatonin treatment demonstrated that Melatonin improved sleeping behavior among breast cancer survivors, the REF 49. The dose of melatonin that a patient needs to have restorative sleep may vary from 0.5 mg to 20 mg depending on how melatonin is metabolized by that individual. A recent study found that the timing of administration of melatonin was important. The survival benefit among patients with advanced non-small cell lung cancer was only seen with melatonin administered in the evening and among those whose sleep had normalized a REF 50. Since the secretion of melatonin decreases as a person grows older, a recent review concluded that patients should begin with an initial melatonin trial to correct impaired sleep to improve quality of life. If ineffective, then it is important to prescribe other medications to optimize the sleep quality in the cancer patient. 5. Melatonin, a potential chemotherapy agent. Melatonin is mainly produced by the pineal gland, from tryptophan, in response to darkness. 
melatonin is released as it is synthesized, and it contributes to regulating homeostatic metabolic rhythms to protect the body from disease development. It has been shown that melatonin regulates sleep-wake cycles, the immune system, bone homeostasis, and arterial blood pressure, provides potential neuroprotection, and acts as an antioxidant RF48. As an antioxidant, melatonin has been shown to 1. stimulate antioxidant synthesis, 2. scavenge reactive oxygen species and reactive nitrogen species, 3. reduce free radical generation, 4. generate a radical scavenger cascade, 5. enhance other antioxidant activities, and 6. regulate antioxidant enzymes UREF48. In addition, melatonin is an anti-inflammatory agent, has anti-angiogenetic effects, and potentiates cancer cell apoptosis, BREF51. It has also been shown to potentiate the actions of other antioxidants and chemotherapy agents, BREF4148. Extensive studies have focused on the potential beneficial effect of melatonin in HNC patients, BREF52-55. Gonzalez et al., REF 56, reviewed 17 clinical trials and analyzed the anti-angiogenic effects of melatonin. Positive effects included longer survival times, less severe side effects, and better quality of life. Melatonin dosages were 10 to 20 mg, given 1 H before bedtime. A recent study using 20 mg of melatonin, after neoadjuvant chemotherapy, for locally advanced oral squamous cell carcinoma found a decrease in the expression of MIR210 and CD44 followed by a decrease in the percentage of the residual tumor, but not significant, P equals 0.114, REF 57. A comprehensive review of the clinical trials using melatonin as adjunctive therapy and the biological effects of melatonin has recently been published and discusses the limitations that need to be addressed going forward with clinical trials utilizing this medication for cancer therapy REF 45, 46, 49, 58. The safety profile of high doses of melatonin has recently been reviewed. The most common adverse events were tiredness, dizziness, drowsiness, fever, headache, and diarrhea which were also present in study control groups, REF 59. 6. Diet. 6.1. Overview of recommendations for diet after cancer diagnosis. While randomized prospective dietary trials are limited, there is some evidence that suggests patients diagnosed with cancer can improve their future health by following a careful well-balanced diet. A recent review demonstrated this effect by evaluating food frequency questionnaires. They identified significant reductions in the risks of 10-year cancer-specific and all-cause mortality among patients with cancer that followed dietary recommendations, compared to controls. Diets were evaluated with the Healthy Eating Index, HEI, 2015, the Alternative HEI 2010, the Alternate Mediterranean Diet, or the dietary approaches to stop hypertension scores a REF 60. Table 1 outlines the recent basic dietary recommendations for reducing the risk of cancer recurrence a REF 61. Table 1. Dietary recommendations from the World Cancer Research Fund and the American Institute for Cancer Research a REF 61. Increase, whole grains, fruits, vegetables, beans, nuts the goal is to exceed 30 gm fiber per day and 5 portions of fresh fruits or vegetables daily, reduce, fast foods and processed foods, which may be high in simple carbohydrates and fat, sugary drinks, red meat, to maximum 3 portions a week, and avoid processed meats limit. Consumption of alcohol overall goal reduce weight to normal BMI and avoid weight gain. 6.2. Ketogenic diet therapy for cancer. The benefit of a ketogenic diet may be due to the Warburg effect in cancer cells, REF 62, 63, which results in the predominant utilization of glycolysis and little or no ability to utilize ketones. 
It also has a physiological effect on the nervous system, circadian clock, metabolism, immune system and may increase the diversity of the microbiome a ref 62 63 hnc patients had difficulty complying with a ketogenic diet in a phase 1 trial a ref 64 but an interim analysis of the keto comp study nct 02516501 showed a ketogenic diet in hnc patients helped maintain body weight and skeletal mass a ref 65 a new ketogenic regimen trial for stage 4 cancer patients, which varied the carbohydrate restriction from 10 g daily for the first week, 20 g daily for weeks 2 to 12 and subsequently to 30 g daily, did result in a modest improvement in survival among some patients, the REF 66. Although Roma et al. concluded that evidence is lacking on the clinical efficacy of ketogenic diets for cancer due to the poor adherence, heterogeneous results, and methodological limitations of the trials reviewed a REF 67, Gemmel et al. recently reviewed the therapeutic potential of the ketogenic diet for patients with breast cancer, a REF 68. Human studies confirming benefits are limited by small patient numbers, high patient dropout rates, or retrospective case study designs. It is reasonable, however, to review the benefits of this diet among cancer patients and provide a referral to a dietitian if requested. 6.3. Short-term fasting prior to chemotherapy. Recent studies and reviews have demonstrated that short-term fasting, either immediately before each cycle of chemotherapy or intermittently, reduced chemotherapy toxicity a ref 69 to 73. Intermittent fasting during chemotherapy could potentially improve treatment-related side effects, insulin sensitivity, chemotherapy effectiveness, and quality of life, a REF 74. Further research is ongoing, but patients should be at least advised about this option and encouraged to consider short-term fasting when motivated. An example of fasting before a Chemotherapy cycle would be a restriction of less than or equal to 200 calories for each 24-H cycle during the period from 48-H before to 24-H after chemotherapy, a REF 72. 6.4. Duration of fasting and cancer recurrence. Marinac et al. reviewed the effects of different durations of nightly fasting on breast cancer recurrence among 2,413 women without diabetes. They found that fasting less than 13 H overnight was associated with a higher risk of recurrence a REF 75. 7. Smoking. Effect of smoking and response to chemotherapy patients should be encouraged to stop smoking for multiple reasons. Numerous studies have shown that smoking has an adverse effect on the efficacy of chemotherapy, a REF 76. Patients with lung cancer who continue to smoke have a reduced life expectancy compared to patients who stop smoking, a REF 77. In addition, there is an increased risk of a second cancer among active smokers, a REF 78. 8. Green tea. The consideration of green tea GT, as an adjunctive measure is based upon its recognized health benefits since very few trials have been completed using GT because of the difficulty confirming the quantity of tea ingested or the lack of uniformity of green tea extracts GTE. The information presented here is the current knowledge about how green tea affects cancer cells and has the potential to be effective for cancer treatment. 8.1 Background. Green tea, GT, contains elevated levels of catechins, also known as soluble polyphenols, which represent between 30 and 42% of the dry weight, a REF 79. For centuries, Eastern cultures have recognized the health benefits of GT, and recent studies have identified its ability to kill cancer cells and prevent cancer without harming normal cells, a REF 80. However, Western physicians have not widely adopted GT for use in therapy regimens. Several epidemiologic reviews have confirmed an inverse relationship between GT consumption and cancer incidence.
A cup of GT contains 10x the amount of epigallocatechin gallate, EGCG, a bioactive catechin, found in a cup of coffee, or Ref 81. Research studies have demonstrated that T catechins peak in the plasma within 1 to 5 H and have a half life of 2 to 10 H, or Ref 82. Multiple servings of GT daily enhance tissue accumulation by 4 9 X, or Ref 83. The importance of GT consumption is reflected in the ancient Chinese proverb, better to be deprived of food for three days than tea for one inch or ref 80. Since GT side effects are minimal, this readily available drink could benefit anyone's health, particularly patients with cancer. 8.2 Mechanism of GT effect on cancer cells, the Ref 84-90, in 1987, it was first recognized that GT catechins inhibited the lung cancer tumor promoter in the TNF gene, or Ref 83. The benefit of GT is thought to be derived from EGCG and a combination of other catechins. There are comprehensive reviews available on the potential molecular targets and signaling pathways involved in the GT effects on cancer cells, the REF 84 to 89. Most of these effects are summarized in Table 2. Table 2. Major effects of green tea catechins on cancer cells, not all inclusive. Induces cellular apoptosis, cellular necrosis, cell cycle arrest. Impacts cell morphology, protein synthesis. Inhibits metastasis, angiogenesis, proliferation DNA methylation, immune checkpoint proteins, transcription and translation of genes that encode stemless markers, spheroid formation in stem cells, glutamine dehydrogenase and other enzyme pathways. Other effects, anti-inflammatory, antioxidative and pro-oxidative effects. Ruhal Amin et al. identified that the combination of EGCG and resveratrol synergistically increased apoptosis in xenografted head and neck tumors in nude mice by inhibiting AKTMTOR signaling in vitro and in vivo or F90. 8.3. Human studies. Evidence of green tea effects on specific cancers prospective and epidemiological studies have suggested that GT is effective in preventing or delaying recurrence of certain cancers, the REF 91, 92. For example, stages 1 and 2 breast cancer, compared to patients who consumed less than or equal to 4 cups of GT a day, those who consumed greater than or equal to 5 cups per day had fewer recurrences, 16.7% versus 24.3%, P less than 0.05 over seven years, and a longer average disease free period, 3.6 versus 2.6 years, Ref 91. High grade prostate intraepithelial neoplasia, a proof of principle, double blind, placebo controlled, one year study, N equals 60 men, showed that, among 30 men taking three, 200 mg GT Kachin capsules daily. Only one prostate cancer was diagnosed, compared to nine invasive cancers diagnosed in the placebo arm RF 93. Advanced premalignant lesions of the oral cavity and larynx. Treatment with green tea polyphenon E, 200 mg 3x day, combined with escalating dose of EGFR tyrosine kinase inhibitor, erlotinib in a phase 1b study found the combination was well tolerated and 17 21sts patients showed pathological improvement and increased cancer-free survival a ref 94. 8.4. Safety concerns. Although green tea extract, GTE, or a bolus dose of EGCG was causally associated with hepatic toxicity, no toxicity was observed with GT beverages across a wide range of intakes and conditions, Ref 82. GTE are not all the same, and Kachin profiles differ depending upon the manufacturing process, the Ref 95. A GTE limit of 300 mg per day is advised, due to hepatic side effects, though a recent study on lupus found no adverse reactions, 
after administering 1,000 mg per day EGCG, a REF 96. Additionally, mild hypertension was associated with GT, due to the caffeine content, one quarter the caffeine content of black tea. EGCG is also a potential P-glycoprotein substrate, and thus, it may influence the availability of drugs that require this transport enzyme, such as digoxin or REF97. Therefore, a drug reaction evaluation is recommended. However, GT exhibited anti-cancer effects that were synergistic with numerous chemotherapy agents, in vitro or REF98. Japanese loose leaf GT has almost twice the EGCG content as Chinese tea, a REF 99. The majority of EGCG is extracted in 160 to 180 degrees Fahrenheit water after 3 to 4 minutes. Longer brewing may cause Kate chin degradation, a REF 100. It is universally accepted that brewing loose leaf tea provides more benefits than tea bags. Evaluation of potential drug drug reaction with GT should be performed prior to recommending green tea consumption to a patient. If there is no contraindication, then the interested patient should be encouraged to consume at least 1000 cc of green tea daily throughout the day for the optimal antineoplastic benefit. 9. Curcumin or turmeric. For centuries, Asian cultures have recognized the medicinal properties of turmeric, curcuma longa, a cooking spice. In cancer, turmeric has antioxidant, anti-inflammatory, anti-angiogenic, chemosensitizing, and apoptotic properties, the REF 101102. Multiple studies have demonstrated the effects of turmeric against cancer cells in vitro, a REF 103 to 105 and a recent review by Kabir discusses the effectiveness of newer formulations of turmeric against multiple cancer types, including HNC, or REF 106. Because turmeric absorption is poor, recent. Research has focused on how to incorporate turmeric into chemotherapy, REF 107 to 109. Fargadani and NIDA reviewed recent studies and human trials on curcumin effects in breast cancer, REF 110, and Chen reported that curcumin analog HO3867 activates, JNK1, 2 signaling in human oral squamous cell cancer cells, the REF 111. Several meta-analyses and controlled trials have identified the effectiveness of different formulations of turmeric for control of treatment-induced oral mucositis among HNC patients, the REF 112 to 114. There are no known significant side effects of curcumin, rarely patients may rarely report various complaints, such as flatulence, diarrhea, nausea, constipation, tongue redness, tachycardia, or yellow stools. However, curcumin may interact with cardiovascular agents, antibiotics, antidepressants, anticoagulants, chemotherapeutic drugs, and antihistamines, the REF 115. It is usually recommended for better absorption for it to be taken with food containing fat. 10. Aspirin. The anti-cancer effect of aspirin was first recognized by Gassick et al. in the 1970s, the REF 116. Petrono and Rocca reviewed studies on aspirin for preventing and treating gastrointestinal cancer. They demonstrated that aspirin significantly reduced cancer incidence and mortality, the REF 117. Multiple prospective studies are currently ongoing on the use of aspirin as adjunctive therapy for cancer, because its effects include blunting proliferative signaling, restoring growth suppressors, modulating immune cells, inhibiting telomerase, which reduces cellular immortality, reducing inflammation, impending invasion and metastasis, restricting angiogenesis, inhibiting genome instability, and reversing energy metabolism reprogramming, the REF 118. Elwood recently completed an extensive review of published observational studies where aspirin was administered to cancer patients and identified a potential 20% reduction in Mortality among aspirin users, the REF 119. However, 
a Danish national cohort study of patients with head and neck squamous cell cancer did not find an overall survival benefit from aspirin use for REF120. As with any therapy, the potential benefit of aspirin regarding survival in patients with cancer versus its potential risk should be carefully assessed on an individual basis. 11. Metformin Metformin is being extensively studied as adjunctive therapy for cancer, REF 121-125. The molecular anti-cancer effects and clinical trials for cancer using metformin have been recently reviewed by Bachinska et al. REF 126 and Sari et al. REF 127. Metformin was also shown to reduce chemobrain REF 128. Currently, the most pressing question is whether metformin might be effective and safe for patients without diabetes. A recent systematic review and meta-analysis found that, among patients without diabetes who were treated for breast cancer, metformin improved overall survival by 65%, compared to those who did not receive metformin for REF 129. However, Another trial showed that 2,000 mg of metformin increased the side effects and worsened the outcomes, compared to the conventional therapy for unresected, locally advanced non-small cell lung cancer, or REF 130. Moreover, metformin showed no added benefit in a randomized phase 2, 3 study that compared. Paclitaxel, a carboplatin, a metformin to paclitaxel, a carboplatin, a placebo as initial therapy for stage. 3. IVA, IVB, or recurrent endometrial cancer, a REF 131. Ongoing studies aim to identify the types of patients who might benefit from metformin. Metformin therapy has been found to be safe when used for other non-diabetic conditions including obesity, REF 132 rheumatoid arthritis, REF 133, and for women with metastatic breast cancer, REF 134, although there was insufficient evidence of the benefits on survival. Limiting side effects of metformin are predominantly gastrointestinal. A careful review of potential drug reactions with planned chemotherapy or treatment is recommended. 12. Statin therapy. Statins were recognized in the 1990s as effective anti-cancer agents, but their use as adjuncts for patients with cancer remains controversial and consequently has not been approved as a cancer therapy. Research and in vivo studies have demonstrated mixed results. A provider considering adding a statin as adjunctive therapy should carefully review the most current literature regarding the chemotherapy agent that is being used and the possible adjunctive statin. This is an area that is receiving a great deal of attention and research. An inverse relationship between statin use and the incidence of head and neck cancer was found in an analysis of a large population database in Taiwan REF 135. Bourguillon et al. concluded that statins may be beneficial by reducing side effects from chemotherapy, the radiotherapy, and improving survival based on the results of HNC trials, the REF 136. A 2020 review by Matusiewicz et al., the REF 137, suggested that statins may be beneficial. For treating metastatic cancers, due to their inhibition of the epithelial mesenchymal. Transition. In this transition, cancer cells gain metastatic abilities and may become multipotent mesenchymal cancer-like stem cells. Statins have inhibited this activity in prostate, ovarian, breast, and esophageal cancers. In addition, because statins inhibit HMG-CoA reductase, the rate-limiting step in cholesterol synthesis, they limit the production of mevalinate. Mevalinate produces Kenzyme Q10, which is an important electron transporter in the electron transport chain. Statins will lower CoQ10 levels and cause abnormal mitochondrial respiration, loss of antioxidant protection, and increase apoptotic cell death, the REF 138. 
Mevalinate also gives rise to acetoacetyl-CoA, an activator of pro-inflammatory macrophages, the REF-139. Sekel reported, however, that although pravastatin was well tolerated with standard chemotherapy treatment for small cell lung cancer, there was no benefit in outcome for REF-140. Whether the statin is hydrophilic or lipophilic may be important regarding their effectiveness against cancer, the REF-141. A recent review by PUN elicits statins' effects both as monotherapy against cancer and the potential synergistic effect with anti-cancer drugs to reduce drug resistance, but also noted the excessive toxicity that has occurred in some situations, the REF-142. The synergistic effect of lovastatin was confirmed by in vitro analysis with tamoxifen, doxorubicin, methotrexate, and rapamycin, but not with 5-fluoracyl, gemcitabine, ipothalone, cisplatin, cyclophosphamide and etoposide the REF-143. A retrospective observation review found that the combination of statin and metformin therapy in a cohort of patients with prostate cancer was well tolerated and was associated with lower glycin score and longer survival a REF-144. A careful review of potential drug reactions with planned chemotherapy or treatment is recommended. 13. Conclusions Providers also need to be aware of the potential benefit of non-traditional therapies to improve the patient's outcomes with cancer. Although they may have been trained to use only medications or supplements that have been proven in rigorous scientific human trials, it may be time to become more open to including complementary or adjunctive therapies, particularly focusing on the risk of benefit ratio for each patient. Suggestions reviewed include the use of medications off-label that could potentially help patients without causing harm. Patients need help in fighting cancer from each of their providers and may be more open to several of these recommendations and referrals if made by their practitioner. However, any adjunctive medication therapy considered should be carefully researched by the provider to help reduce harmful side effects, while such recommendations as attention to a balance. Diet, increased exercise, optimized sleep, and regular mindfulness are usually of low risk. Risk. And uh, that was it. That was the uh, review paper completely. I'm going to show you the address once again, the URL, where you can go and uh, download the um, study yourself if you want to check the references. The references are all in the uh, PDF document that uh, you can get from this uh, URL. So, uh, hope you will. Um, uh, the, the, some people will be benefic benefited uh, from this uh, video, the audio version of this review paper. So, um, that's it for today, and I hope to see you again in the future. Take care. Bye bye.